Hi. Yes, I'm a scientist. I admit it. By training, but truly at heart. And for the past 10 years, I've been designing and installing small-scale solar and wind systems. Solar panels and small wind turbines can be accessible, appropriate technologies for many people. You connect them directly to the grid and generate energy with free fuel and no batteries and get paid for the clean electricity at the same rate that the utility charges you. I like these attributes. They feel good and right and meaningful to me. But feel good and right are not enough. These systems have to work and work well for a long time. In a word, they must be sustainable. But that's the problem at least with small wind turbines, because over the years I've observed that many, if not most of them, have, let's just say, issues with their long-term reliability. So, for this reason, about three years ago, I started a new company with some very smart, dedicated, people working on an idea that we think will change the wind industry. We are convinced that a small wind turbine can be built to require no maintenance for at least 15 years. And so we claim to now have produced such a machine. But I'm going to let you be the judge of that. More than anything else, though, what I'd really like you to understand is that my main motivation for doing all of this has been this graph, this relentless increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide with dire consequences for our planet, and which by now I think almost everyone is familiar with for a variety of reasons, some physical, some political. We've been unable to stop this curve or even slow it down, at least so far. Personally, I find this unacceptable and unbefitting of a creative, intelligent species. We are better than this. And so, on some level and in some measure, I honestly have felt like it's my responsibility to be doing something about this. Because after all, we all live here and only here. And it is this that fundamentally connects us all. But the good news is, that renewable energy has the power to mitigate the worst effects of climate change, and this technology is now being installed at a staggering rate. Over the past decade, the exponential growth of photovoltaics, solar panels, suggests that finally, solar has now gained widespread mainstream acceptance. In fact, just in the United States, solar is being st installed on a gigawatt scale annually now. But over the same period of time, I've seen small wind turbines not gain this same level of acceptance. In fact, new installations have been declining since the 2008 recession. Why is this? Well, from personal experience, the answer is crystal clear to me. It's because most small wind turbines are not controlled well enough. In high winds, like Hurricane Sandy, they tend to spin too fast, which leads to problems 
and frequent maintenance and premature failure. So, obvious question, why are they spinning too fast? It's the physics, which says that the power of the wind is proportional to the cube of the wind speed. It's this physical fact which makes wind power both practical and destructive. Here it is plotted out. What this means is that when the wind speed increases, say from 10 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour, and that can happen in the space of just a few seconds during a typical thunderstorm, the power of the wind increases 64 times. Such a sudden increase in power can easily destroy any wind turbine, large or small, that is not both well controlled and well protected. Dealing with this power is the fundamental reason why wind turbines work and why they fail. But in any given location, the wind also has a distribution. And this one is typical for our region. What's remarkable is that 99% of all the winds we experience are less than 30 miles per hour. High winds over 30 miles per hour occur less than 1% of the time. So why does that matter? Again, it's the physics, which says that the energy produced by a wind turbine is equal to the power of the wind multiplied by the amount of time the wind blows. And because it's energy that we all pay for when we use electricity, it's the product, it's the overlap of those two curves that's important. So when you multiply them together to get energy, what you see is that 90% of all available energy in the wind occurs at wind speeds less than 30 miles per hour. But we also know that 90% of all damage to small wind turbines occurs at winds over 30 miles per hour. So knowing that, doesn't it make sense to just turn the machine off in winds over 30 miles per hour? Or in some way, slow it down during high winds? So for this reason, almost all wind turbines, large and small, have some mechanism to slow the machine during high winds, like disc brakes, or centripetal brakes, or pitch control of the blades, or pitch control of the entire rotor, or offsetting of the rotor axis, and this list goes on. But fundamentally, all of these systems are complex. I'd like you to hold on to that thought. And furthermore, the slow growth of the industry suggests at least to me, that no small wind turbine has yet been developed that properly deals with the overspeed problem. Okay. If your machine is 100 feet up in the air. If it requires regular maintenance, this is not an easy or inexpensive proposition. Let's consider a car analogy. If your car runs for, say, 200,000 miles over 15 years, then it's averaging about 35 miles per hour and one hour of driving per day. And during that time, it will have had dozens of oil changes, several sets of new tires, multiple brake jobs, and so on, and I think that's being optimistic. But what if, what if you wanted to design a car or a wind turbine that required no maintenance at all? Is that just silly? And yet, that's precisely the design goal for our machine, for it to operate around the clock with no maintenance for 15 years and beyond. Okay. So, if the wind blows for, on average, 10 hours per day, 
that works out to 10 times the operating hours of my optimistic car. Some 60,000 hours with no maintenance instead of 6,000 hours. All right. So where does one begin? There's a principle called Occam's Razor, which asserts that simple solutions, simple explanations, are to be preferred over more complicated ones. With that in mind, we started simple with an entirely conventional upwind, horizontal axis, three blade design, just like the large utility scale machines. And like many small wind turbines, our machine also has a tail. But this tail is special. Not only does it keep it pointed into the wind during normal operation, it can protect the machine when winds become too strong. When the turbine knows the winds are too strong. So how does it know? And how exactly does it protect itself? We decided to take an active approach, meaning we gave it an autopilot, really nothing more than a small, inexpensive microcomputer that does the decision making. All the critical parameters like wind speed, RPM, voltage, current, and so on are monitored several times per second. So the turbine decides when the machine should slow down and when it can speed up again. That's how it knows. And how does it protect itself? Well, just as this plane is controlled, is steered by its rudder, our machine is controlled by its tail. In high winds, a small motor moves our lightweight tail so that it pivots on a hinge. It folds up so that the tail and the rotor become nearly parallel. And so because of this, the force of the wind acts on this intentionally long lever arm, on this intentionally large tail area, pushing on the tail and turning the rotor parallel to the wind. And so the blades slow down, and most of the too powerful to handle wind just slips by. And when the high winds subside, the tail unfolds again, and the machine resumes normal operation. We've now been through thousands of hours of real world testing. And this has worked every time, without exception. In simplest terms, we're using the wind to control the wind turbine. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. Thanks. <laughs>